And please stand as able once you've found the scripture, and we'll read that together. Again, that's Psalm chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. It also will be behind me, uh, but it's kind of nice to have the Bible in front of us so we can uh, reference it through the message. Again, it's Psalm chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. May the Lord bless the reading of God's word. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. So today's message is called Fruit in a Dry Season. And friends, I am very concerned with fruit. I like fruit. I think fruit is great. But we talk about fruit in a figurative sense a lot in Christian circles, right? We talk about good things coming out of your life. That in the scripture, it talks about the fruit of the spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These good things that we want to come out of our life. And I'm concerned with fruit because I want good things to come out of my life. I want love and joy and peace and patience and on and on, right? I want those things flowing out of my life. You know, not the, the not so good things, the complaining and the, you know, the depression and the uh, stubbornness and, you know, a, a, a negative attitude. I don't want those things flowing out of my life, but I want fruit. And so, um, you know, I was just thinking about fruits, uh, you know, as I'm concerned about fruit. I think we can learn a lot uh, because, you know, I think the Bible has, God has picked that metaphor for a reason. Uh, so, you know, I was thinking about fruit and when it comes and when it doesn't. And I was thinking about uh, this time when I went on uh, the first field trip ever that, that I, I went on with uh, my daughter, Elise, for school. So she was in kindergarten and they were going to visit an apple orchard in Michigan. There's a lot of them. They're very popular in the fall. And, uh, you know, you can go and you can pick apples off trees, just like in this picture, you know? So I was really excited about this. And when I went there, actually, um, we had like sort of this sit down uh, with people from the apple orchard. So we were inside, uh, we're in this like little barn and they did this presentation about how apples grow. And they picked two parents, and I was one of the parents, and, you know, I think I was a bee or something, and I had to pretend to be a bee. And then, you know, we're, we're like, all excited. They're like, hey, you guys want to pick apples? And we're like, yeah. And they're like, what? <laughs> so I don't know if you guys remember this for those who were in Michigan, but three years ago, there were no apples in Michigan. So what happened was at the beginning of March, when it's usually still cold, we had a massive warm-up. And the warm-up lasted for weeks. And what happened was all the trees in Michigan started to bud early, right? And so they started to bud uh, before they were supposed to because I guess the way it works is they could kind of sense the heat and, you know, all, all those things. They could sense that it was warming up. And so the trees got tricked into, you know, kind of producing that fruit too early. And so as they were starting to bud, and it's slow, it takes a while, right? It takes a few months. And then you have these nice apples in, at the end of summer and in fall. But in April, we, we, it got cold again. And there was a, a massive frost throughout Michigan. And then it killed all of the fruit. No apples, no peaches, nothing in, in Michigan. And so, you know, they're like, yeah, there's no apples. And we're like, oh, man, why did you explain to us how apples were grown and all this stuff? And I guess that's what they do. You know, they had to stick to the script. So instead, we picked pumpkins and we could buy apples that I guess they like imported from like Washington State or something like that. Right. It was very sad. You know, what I found out is that there are certain situations where fruit does not grow. And obviously, in biblical times, the time when fruit wouldn't grow is in the dry season which is basically all the time, right? They lived in the desert. And so there was only certain kinds of fruit that could grow in the desert. And when there was a particular dry spell, you know, because of all the heat and lack of moisture, a lot of times fruit just wouldn't grow very well in the desert. Makes sense. You know, I found out that, uh, so um, a couple years ago, it wasn't the, the warm-up that killed fruit but actually the extreme cold. So some of you may remember, we had record-setting snow and record-setting uh, cold all in the same year. 
uh, I, I think that was what, 2014, 2000, end of 2013, beginning of 2014. And um, a lot of fruit didn't grow because it was too cold. So certain fruit uh, can't survive uh, the extreme cold. Apples can, but certain kinds of grapes and peaches cannot. And so there are certain situations that cause it where fruit does not come out of trees. And in the same way, I think there are certain situations that cause it where fruit doesn't come out of our lives. And I have noticed for me that I go through dry seasons. Maybe you do too. What is a dry season for you? Well, for me, dry seasons are, honestly, most of the time it has to do with how I feel. When I'm not feeling good, then fruit is probably not coming out of my life. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control is probably not coming out of my life, right? You know, but um, maybe, you know, complaining is coming out of my life. You know, bad habits are coming out of my life. I'm not motivated, right? But in the sort of rainy seasons, the good times, right, which tend to be like success when things are going well in my life. So if I'm feeling good, then good things come out, right? And maybe you're the same way. And sometimes it's like, I preached a message that I like felt really good about. You know, I was on fire that day, you know? And so then I go home and I'm like really motivated. I'm like, God is good. You know, like, like all the time, God is good. And I'm so like on fire for God and my prayers are more fervent. But you know, I was thinking about that and it's like, you know, am I on fire for God just because I preached a good sermon? You know, maybe it's like that for you. Like you go outside and the sun is shining and, you know, all your relationships are going well. You're not in debt. You know, uh, you, you just got a you know, straight A's on your report card. You just got a promotion. You know, you had a good conversation with a good friend. And then all of a sudden, everything is peaches and roses in your spiritual life. And, and you, you're motivated to do things for God, right? Friends, I think that makes sense. But what about the dry seasons then? What about the times when you don't feel like being loving and being gentle and being patient? right? What about those times? How can we then bear fruit through our dry seasons in life? And that's what I want to know. Because what I find is that, you know, for a lot of people, a lot of Christians in this age, that, um, you know, when we're feeling good, when things are going well, then things are really going well. But when they're not, we can really get thrown off our game. And sometimes we get stuck. You know, I've mentioned that you know, I'm a very emotional person. Um, I think that is both my strength and weakness. And one of the things that has kind of plagued me being a very emotional person is depression. The cloud of depression has followed me for most of my adult life. And, you know, I talk about these funks that I would get into from time to time and getting stuck. And when you get in a funk, sometimes you don't even know why you're there. You don't know what you're supposed to be doing and you certainly lack the motivation to do it. I'm not feeling particularly kind or charitable. I'm not feeling particularly spiritual. You know, friends, for all of us, you have your own funks. You have your own things that you go through, your own valleys that you walk through where you might feel stuck. And I want to know, and probably we all want to know, how do we get out of this? How can we bear fruit? in dry seasons. And so it's very cool to me to know that God wanted to teach us about this. And so this is the very first Psalm that we just read, we're gonna look at again, that talks about how we can bear fruit in our lives. And so let's take a look at Psalm chapter one. It said, blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. Friends, I just wanna, you know, stay there for a moment to delight in the law of the Lord. So the law was the first five books of the Bible. This was the Bible for uh, the person who wrote the Psalms, uh, or for the person who wrote this Psalm, and for a lot of the Israelites, that was their Bible, right? The law. And so, you know, maybe for some of us, we think to ourselves, the law is good, you know, the, the, the Bible is good. You know, I should read my Bible. But this idea that 
This person delights in it, wants to know it. It is, is kind of foreign to me a little bit, right? And this person doesn't just read it, but they meditate on it. They think about it. They turn it over in their mind day and night. And such a person, what the Bible tells us, is that person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Remember, friends, what we're talking about in terms of this region. What is a dry season for uh, people in uh, biblical times? Dry season was literally the desert. Everywhere was dry. It was hard to grow any kind of fruit. And so this tree is unique because it is planted by a, a, a source of water that will continue to supply much needed water to its roots, right? And so this tree is able to yield fruit when it's supposed to in season because of that stream of water. That is the thing that brings its it life, Right? And so it's very clear that it's because of the source that is giving life that the tree is able to be fruitful. That this tree does not wither. The leaves don't start getting brown and wrinkly. Right? It prospers. It flourishes. And friends, that is exactly the picture that God is trying to paint for us about our lives, the way our lives are supposed to be. We're not supposed to dry up. We're not supposed to shrivel. When the dry season comes, when difficulty comes, God wants us to continue to be able to flourish, to continue to be alive and to bear fruit, right? But it's very clear that that needs to come from a source of life. We cannot do that on, it, on our own, right? And it just makes sense that when you are in your dry season, right, you are not getting sort of fresh inspiration, you know, you're not feeling good. There's difficulty in life. Maybe you're going through financial difficulty. Maybe you're going through relationship difficulty. And it just affects your whole being. And we are not strong enough, friends, where we have that source of life that comes naturally just from within ourselves, just because we're just really that strong or really that good or really that smart. And sometimes that's the world, what the world tells us. They, they just tell us, hey, just do it. You know, just figure it out. You know, you motivate yourself. And friends, it doesn't quite work that way. You know, we can't just motivate ourselves. We can't just whip ourselves into a frenzy. Um, I told James Coe, I originally had this picture and I was going to take it out. Actually, I think we did take out the picture. But uh, sorry, James, I changed my mind. But <laughs> have, have any of you seen that Shia LaBeouf video? Uh, where he talks about, yeah, so some people are, are chuckling, you know what I'm talking about. Um, there, there's, there's a video that I think the title is like the most in, intense motivational speech that you'll ever hear. The most intense like one minute motivational speech. And Shia LaBeouf, who's this actor, he was in Transformers and I think he was like a Disney actor before. Um, oh yeah, there it is. Okay. <laughs> So he, it's, it's a really weird video because he does these like kind of like WrestleMania like moves. Like he, so he keeps yelling at us and he keeps going, just do it. He's like, if you want to make your dreams come true, stop talking about it. Just do it. And he keeps flexing. And maybe that's why they call him Shia LaBeouf. I don't know. <laughs> but, you know. So he's kind of yelling at us, and, and I remember someone told me about this video because they're like, oh, have you seen this video? Man, I watched this video, and it just gets me pumped up. I just get really motivated, you know? And the whole theme of the video is, you know, stop thinking, stop whining, stop complaining. If you want something good to happen in your life, then just do it. It's that simple. It's the whole Nike motto, right? Just motivate yourself. Just think in your brain, you know what? I need to just do it. I need to stop whining. I need to stop complaining. I need to stop wallowing in misery. But friends, if it were that easy, wouldn't we all do it? If it was that simple, you just do it. Friends, this is the myth that the world tells us. And then what they tell us is that when you can't do it, it's your fault. There's something wrong with you. You just aren't good enough. You aren't strong enough. You aren't smart enough. Because if you were, then you would be like the successful people in life. And friends, it's a myth. If you are a tree and you have no water, 
What's going to happen to you? This could be the smartest tree, the most motivated tree. The tree could be sitting there, just do it, just do it. I don't know what a tree sounds like, but <laughs> that's my imagination, right? No amount of thought, no amount of motivation will cause fruit to come from that tree when it has no water. It's just not going to happen, friends. And this is what happens to all of us when we are away from the source of life that is God. Why is meditating on the Word of God so important in bringing about this sort of life change, in bringing about fruit in our lives? The reason why is because the words of God tell us about this God, tell us the truths of God, tell us about his love, tell us about his plan, tell us that he is alive, that he is powerful, that we don't need to worry about all the things that we so often worry about. It is literally life-giving. And so if we want life to come out of us, fruits, living things, right? That's what fruit is, right? It's the result of a healthy tree that is planted by the streams of water, by the source of life. Um, you know, I, I think about just uh, uh, another sort of way of thinking about it is meat. <laughs> so I've been cooking a lot uh, for my family. This past year, I've been cooking just about every dinner for my family. And I've been trying to learn new recipes, and I really love meat. Do we have any meat lovers here? Or some, some of you, a lot of you. <laughs> and what I found is that, man, I want that meat to taste good, and I want it to be soft. So I learned the wonders of marinating meat, right? And so if you take this meat and you soak it in a delicious sauce that's got good things in it, right, that the meat will start to taste like that, right? It'll start to permeate through it. But you know, friends, one of the things that I learned about meat and one of the myths of marination is that meat is a lot tougher than we think. You know, what they find is that um, people like, they're like, oh yeah, yeah, you know, marinate it for hours. And they find that even if you marinate meat for hours, oftentimes the, the flavor will only get on the surface. The sauce doesn't seep in, right? So one of the tricks of marination that they say is that to cut holes in the meat, right? Or use something acidic so it starts to soften up the meat. But meat is a lot tougher than we think. And sometimes it takes days to really get that full flavor. I had a, uh, uh, when I was in high school, I worked in a research lab uh, for a, uh, she was a doctor and a researcher. And when she would have barbecues, she did the coolest thing. Like she, she would have barbecues with like a bunch of other doctors. And what they did was they got a meat of, uh, they got sauce and they put it in an IV and they fed it into a pig, right? And so in the way, same way that you would put like, like fluids through your body, they fed the barbecue sauce through the pig. So it was really infused inside, right? You know, I'm like, man, that's awesome. I know we have some people in the medical field, so maybe we can try this sometime. We can have LGM barbecue with um, meats, IV, barbecue, IV. That would be awesome, right? Does that sound like a good idea? But the idea is that th that word, that, that sauce gets all up in the animal and just infuses every part of it. Um, I, I had this friend who really loved barbecue, and uh, he was a pastor, and we were planning a youth retreat together, and he really, really wanted to call uh, the, the retreat, the theme of the retreat, to be marinating in Christ. Because I think we're, we're like at a Korean barbecue, and we're eating like, you know, ribs, and he's like, hey, how about marinating in Christ? And, and you know, I, I think we ended up shooting that idea down, but I kind of wish we did that, right? The idea that, man, you get saucier, right? You get more filled when you are marinating in that word, right? And that's what this picture is to me, this idea of meditating on Scripture, just letting it get all up in there, you know, just get in every crevice of who you are, that what happens is that it starts to come out of you. No, if you just inject the Word of God into you, and you're turning it over, you're reading it, you're thinking about it all the time. I know some people that, you know, they know that they're going to have a tough week. They know it's hard to motivate themselves, so they'll put Scripture everywhere. You know, they'll put it on little post-it notes, and they'll put it on their mirror, right? And it'll remind them that God loves them, that God chose them, that God has great plans for them. 
You know, they'll put it on their steering wheel. They'll put it, you know, in their cubicle at work. They'll put it everywhere that they can be reminded of that truth. They'll listen to scripture in the car or listen to to songs uh, that have gospel truth in the car to be reminded of these things. You know, the more that it's coming into you, it's going to start coming out of you. But friends, there's another thing that what this truth says is that sometimes the things that are coming into us are not good, right? And so... um, I have this story, and I was on the fence whether or not I was going to share the story. Um, it's something I shared, I think, in my early days at LGM. It's kind of become an infamous story. But after the Indian mission team was so freely talking about their bowel movements, I feel freed uh, to share this story with you. So when I was in seminary, I had this particular love for McDonald's Chicken McNuggets. And they used to have these promotions where you could get a 20-piece Chicken McNugget meal for $3 or $2.99. I was like, oh, 20 chicken McNuggets for $2.99? It's like the best thing, right? And so they would have this promotion for like about two weeks. And during that promotion, I kid you not, I would eat a 20-piece chicken McNugget every single day, sometimes twice a day, right? I'm like, it's such a good deal, right? I'm a poor seminary student, you know? So $2.99, you can't get better than that, right? And I just eat chicken McNuggets like, you know, morning, noon, and night. And at the end of this two weeks, There's a time, like, we had this communal bathroom, right, like, in our dorms at the seminary, and I was in there. Some of you kind of are anticipating where this story is going, Um, but but I was at the urinal, right, doing my business. You know, we won't get into the the details, but I'm sitting there, and, you know, um, my, my (laughs) sorry, one of my, 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 my friend, one of my really good friends was there, and I, I'm, I'm doing my business, and all of a sudden, I'm like, Oh my goodness, my pee smells like chicken McNuggets. And my friend, I was like, hey, come over here, come over. He comes over and he's like, oh my gosh, your pee smells like chicken McNuggets. And it's true, it was just coming out of me, right? And my theory was I was transforming into a chicken McNugget, right? Like, if I kept going, if I kept doing this for a couple more months, like, my skin would have started getting kind of crispy brown. You know, I st- started would have been shaped like a shoe, because you know all chicken McNuggets are either a circle or a shoe. You, you guys know that, right? I would have become like a shoe, right, in the same shape, right? But friends, in so many ways, we know this. You are what you eat. So this principle is not just about good things but not so good things. And this is actually how the the scripture starts. It says, blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers. And so friends, you know, it's like, hey, bad company breeds bad character. We've heard that, right? You hang out with sinful people all the time in sinful areas, probably sinful things are gonna start coming out of you. I shared the story once that, there was this one kid in my youth group back in Maryland, and he had this problem with cussing. And there was this one time, I mean, like, it, it seriously would happen, like, all the time. He would, like, cuss and, like, whatever. And, um, you know, there's one time, like, we're, we're at church, and I think we're, like, we used to have a Bible study in our sanctuary. And we're sitting there in the sanctuary, you know, there's a cross behind us, and he's just talking about his week, and then he just, I think the S word just slipped out, right? He just said it, like, and then he was like, Oh, Pastor Steve, I'm so sorry, you know, and it would happen all the time at church. And, you know, I used to like kind of get mad at him, like, man, what's wrong with you, dude? You know, we're in church, like, you know, why are you cussing and all that stuff? But what I realized is that it made sense when I was in the brother's car, because when I was in his car, he would listen to, we used to call it gangster rap, like back in the day in the 90s, but he would listen to the most profane music. And it was just cussing over and over again. Right? And this is what he would fill his mind. He would fill his life with. So guess what? It started to come out of his mouth. Right? It just started to come out of his life automatically because that's what he was around. And one of the things, too, I mean, you know, that's a very simple message that I think we can all embrace. You know, you hang around bad company, bad things are going to start coming out of you. But I really think what's interesting is this idea of sitting in the company of mockers. And friends, I think that's very interesting because I think we live in a culture and society of mockers. You know what I mean? Like a mocker, somebody who like makes fun of things, makes light of it, is always criticizing things, is always cynical, is looking at that like, oh, that's stupid. When they see someone really sincere, like, oh, I really love my mom. They're like, I really love my mom. You know, you're just mocking people, right? 
we live in a whole society that whenever you see people really sincere, you know, you see someone with their Bible, like, Psh, look at that guy with their Bible, you know, they just mock it. And that's the society we live in, right? We live in this very cynical age where, you know, nothing is sincere anymore. You know, it's hard for us to get really excited about good things because people are always mocking things. People are always slighting them. People are always undermining them. And friends, the more we spend time in this world and we hear these mocking messages and we hear these things that are taking us away from life, it makes sense then why more good things aren't coming out of our life. And so friends, then it becomes that much more important for us to get in the Word of God and to get in it every day. Even more so, I want to uh, take a look at a New Testament example of this. This is John 15. You guys don't have to turn there, but we'll just put it up on the screen. John 15, 5 through 8. So here Jesus is also talking about fruit. This is a very common motif in Scripture. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Again, friends, if we stay in the source of life, then good things will come out of us. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. So again, if we're not staying in that source of life, then we are going to wither. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Isn't that incredible? right? Good things will happen. God will answer your prayers, right? Because we're in God, and then we know God's will, and our prayers are going to start to change too, friends, right? This isn't some sort of wish fulfillment. God isn't just going to give you whatever you selfishly want. There's a lot of scripture that we're not going to get into that talks very clearly about that. But our prayers will start being, your will be done, not mine when we spend more time in him. And we'll know that those are the best prayers to pray. Those are the most joyful prayers to pray. And it says, this is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to me to be my disciples. And this, a lot of John chapter 15 talks about this idea of remaining in Christ. And later he says that, um, you know, the Father loves me, so I love you, so remain in my love. And this idea that when we are connecting to God. We are not just reading words like this isn't some sort of like self-help book, right? This isn't just something to just pump you up and motivate you, you know? And this isn't some sort of magic formula. But what this is, it's the truth of who God is and who you are in God. And so when we read these words and we let them sit in us, it reminds us that God loves you, that he's for you, and that he sent his very son to die for you. And this is why there is so much power in that. Because when we go out in this world and you start getting dry, and remember, you know, well, for me at least, being dry is about not feeling good. And a lot of the not feeling good is when I fail. When I go out there in this world and I try something and I listen to the myths of this world and they say, hey, survival of the fittest. If you're good enough, if you're smart enough, then you'll succeed. And when I fail, then I think, oh, man, I'm just horrible. I didn't just fail. I'm a failure. I'm stupid. I'm worthless. And it just makes me not want to try anymore. It makes me want to hide in a corner and just stuff my face with brownies and eat video games till I die. Right? That's how I feel. I don't feel motivated to bear fruit. I don't feel motivated to love God's people, to make the gospel known. But when I am remaining in the words of God and I'm hearing his words of love, I'm hearing the fact that because the Father loved me, now I love you and I lay down my life for my friends and my enemies. I lay down my life so you can live. And if I'm able to turn that truth over in my mind and to let it seep into my pores, not just stay on the surface, but to let it cut deep. Let it cut deep and let it go deep into every fiber of my being. And I start to believe that. Then I start living different. Friends, one of the things that I've noticed in this age, in this time, and this is myself included, you know, the, the, my contemporaries, my life too, is that a lot of us don't have great love for the Bible. We don't really know it. 
And so we are people going out there fighting a war without a sword, without a weapon, right? We are unequipped, and we're out there, and we are getting our butts kicked. Excuse my French, right? Because the world is out there, and it's beating us down. And we're getting dry. We're withering up. And without the words of life, we don't stand a chance. And so one of the things that I'm learning to do more and more is to rely on Scripture more and more. Read it. Read it in the morning. First thing I do, read the Scripture. If you don't know where to start, friends, you know, most of us, we have smartphones. Get a Bible app. Version is probably the best one out there. It's completely free. It's run by a ministry called lifechurch.tv. And that's their mission is to bring the Bible to the masses. And they'll have a devotional passage every day. And so you can read that. Turn it over in your mind. Meditate on it. You know, find ways to bring this wor these words of life into your life and to let it seep in. You know, listen to um, gospel-centered music, right, that talks about this truth of God loving you. That's another way it can seep in, right? And one of the things that I do when I'm feeling dry and I'm not feeling good, well, one thing that, that is really helping is I'm learning to discipline myself, that I'm learning that part of the reason why I'm dry is because I'm not spending time in the source of life. Right? If I'm not in the Word of God and I haven't been in the Word of God for several days, well, no wonder I'm feeling so cranky. No wonder I'm feeling so defeated. Right? And one of the things I do when I'm spending that time with God, especially when I'm feeling discouraged, is I'll take Scripture and I'll just write it down again, word for word. Right? If you look at my journal, there'll be whole pages that are just Scripture, and I'll just write it down. And, and so as I'm writing it, I'm reading the words, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And I just read it, and I just turn it over in my mind over and over and over again. Friends, are you sick of being dry? Are you sick of running on empty or just depending on, you know, a massive downpouring of good things to happen in your life for you to be motivated? Friends, then we need to go to the source of life. We need to cling to the gospel truth. It says, remain in me, and, and when I and you, then you will bear much fruit. And friends, the glue that helps us to remain in Christ is the gospel, is the truth of how much he loves us. And the Bible is the letter, is the, the, the word, the, the book that tells us of this great love. And so friends, you know, the truth today that we want to share and, and, and I want you to let this truth sink in, to let it marinate in your soul, to bear much fruit, stay planted in the words of life. To bear much fruit, stay planted in the words of life. Right? Can we get the praise team to come up? Why don't we close together uh, with a song as we th think about, you know, really staying planted in the words of life. Friends, I want to ask you guys a question, and I want you to be honest, not for my sake, but for your own sake. You know, um, this will just kind of help you to see where you are. So you can write this down, or you can just think this in your mind. But friends, just for a moment, let's just be really honest. Let's pretend that, you know, I'm not, it's not a pastor who's asking you, or, you know, well, even though I am a pastor, you know, I'm not going to read your mind. I don't know what your life is like. I don't know what your spiritual practices are like. But I know this world, and I know that nowadays just the Bible has been mocked a lot. You know, that sincere faith has been mocked a lot. Reading the Bible, it's not a cool thing anymore. You know, and I know this world, and I know that we live in an age where people don't have great love for the Scripture. So I want to ask you, friends, you know, let's close our eyes for a moment and, and just answer this question for yourself. Do you love these words of life? Really? Do you look forward to them? Do you want to eat them up like they're candy? Like they're delicious marinated meat? Or is it like dry cardboard? It's like some nasty medicine that someone tells you you have to eat. Do you realize your complete dependency on the source of life? Or are we still under this myth that somehow 
by our stick to itiveness, by our own ability to motivate ourselves, that we're just going to figure this out on our own. Friends, are you in the Word? And if you're not, friends, you know what it's like to be dry. Are you sick of it yet? I am. I'm sick of being dry. I don't want to keep going out there trying to motivate myself, just trying to do this on my own. I can't do it anymore. And so I have to come face to face with the fact that there's so often in my life where I haven't had great love for this word. And I want to learn again to love his word, to love God, and to love what he says about me and about his love for this entire world. So friends, why don't we pray? And let's confess that before God. And let's pray that God will give us a new heart for his scripture, for his words, that we'll have a new love for what he wants to bring about in our lives. Let's pray. Precious God, we want to have new love for your word. And we want to confess, Lord, the ways that we've had contempt for it. The ways where we have had zero desire or negative desire to get in your word. But Lord, show us that we can't live this life alone. We need your influence. We need your life. We need your words that come from your Holy Spirit, that come from timeless truth about who we are and about your great love for us, that you would even send your son to die for us. Thank you, God, for that. And help us, God, to take this most valuable gift that you have given us, your very words of life, and to treasure it, to delight in it, marinate and meditate on it day and night. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't we rise for our closing praise to you?